All right, hey everyone. Today I am going to be giving you a little presentation, kind of like my story um, in the Marine Corps of how uh, I came from a software developer, just coding as a hobby to actually pushing production level code to the tactical edge. Um, and today's presentation is called Revolutionizing Software, Empowering Our Teams to Focus on What Matters for a specific purpose. Um, and I really want us to put in the back of our head the word empowering because we'll revisit that at the end of this. Um, very excited, today's the last day of VMware Explorer. I was only here for like two days, so I didn't get to experience the full event, unfortunately, but um, I'm excited to be here next year um, and looking forward to giving you guys this presentation today. So that Marine you see right there um, is me. So Staff Sergeant of Marines, uh, you can just call me Pat. Um, senior software engineer at the Marine Corps Software Factory. Uh, I absolutely love software development. I've been doing it since I was a kid. Um, I was like the nerdiest kid in junior high school, um, developing random applications in the .NET framework. And I don't think he ever thought one day that he'd be standing here um, talking to uh, everyone about software development, uh, especially at the capacity of the Marine Corps. Um, eight years of active duty military service, so I first enlisted in uh, 2015, so quite a long time ago. Um, and really what I've taken, if I were to reflect back on that, is how great Marines are at solving problems. It doesn't matter what the problem is, Marines will always find a way. And I love the fact that the Marine Corps has finally invested in software development natively and organically. And I'm very excited to talk to you guys about that today. Uh, amateur classical pianist. I put this on here because I kind of wanted to like get at like a human level with you guys too. Like nothing has been more difficult than learning piano in my entire life. So I don't know if there's any musicians in this in this crowd here, but go try to learn music. And like the second that you try to read any sheet music, you're going to be mind blown at how difficult it is. Way way more difficult than any language I've ever tried to learn. Um, proud father of two, and I'm sorry, Alexis. I am also a proud husband. Totally forgot to put that in there. Um, but I got two beautiful kids at home, a three-year-old and a uh, seven-month-old. So I mentioned the Marine Corps Software Factory. Uh, that's currently where I'm at right now. But I'm going to take you back in time about three years um, to before I was at the Marine Corps Software Factory. I piloted an MOS, which is a military occupational specialty, um, application developer MOS. And uh, through this journey, um, we've kind of paved the way as to what a software engineer in the Marine Corps will do. And we're carrying that over into the Marine Corps Software Factory. So I'm going to leave it up to our director to be able to describe the Marine Corps Software Factory in literally one sentence. So I'm going to read that to you. A world-class, Marine-led, mission-specific software development capability that enables Marine modernization efforts by delivering software for commanders at the speed of operations to increase the operating force's lethality. So yeah, again, Lieutenant Colonel Bach is like the only person who could describe this in one sentence. But he has a lot of things to unpack from here that I want to kind of unpack with you together today. First is Marine-led. Second is delivering software to commanders at the speed of operations. And last is to increase the operating force's lethality. OK? Marines have changing requirements all the time. The mission changes, the requirements change, and we have to be able to adapt uh, at that capacity. So when we develop software for Marines, not only do the Marines have to be able to adapt, but the developers of the software have to make the systems also adapt. So it's very important to note that he explains at the speed of operations, because that can be very fast. We have to be able to adapt our software and make it deliverable at a high speed because it's going to be irrelevant within just a couple of months or just a couple of years. So we have to be able to, in our software lifecycle, be able to deliver at the speed of relevance for our commanders to increase our force's lethality. All right, I'm going to take you even further back here to our very first project. This is called Ardeus. It's a mouthful, um, so I'll explain it. Uh, in layman's terms, but it stands for Assistant Secretary of the Navy Research Development and Analysis Information System. Okay, so this was, I'm taking you back this far so I can really give you an example of where I started with Spring. So this is back in 2020 to 2021, uh, first ever experience with the Spring framework. 
Um, we chose the Spring Framework for a very specific reason. And let me lay that reason out for you. Our Deus processes data, uh, at the naval data, specific towards contracts and acquisition for programs such as building a naval vessel. And it tracks the cost, performance, and schedule of that, right? So it's very important data that actually reflect, reflects to real world requirements. Very, very, very important stuff. And as we were building this greenfield application, we had to identify what framework can we use that will have a foundation that will let us focus on what matters and not necessarily focus on just getting it stood up. And we obviously chose the Spring Framework um, for all of those reasons. You get starter web, starter security, and starter JPA from Spring Boot. And that's what we used out of the box. And we were able to get going with that. And within that, you get your embedded Tomcat. Uh, you get all sorts of great uh, tr uh, transitive dependencies from these um, spring dependencies that you can bring in. And it allowed us to really focus on the core functions of what Ardeus did. Okay, so now if we were to take that mindset and say, hey, in the future when I develop applications, I saw how quick I could move with the Ardeus application just utilizing the spring framework. So this is a very good foundation for us to to reflect on uh, in the future, and which we're going to get to here soon. But before I even do that, I'm going to take you into the mind of a Marine, OK? Marines operate amidst uncertainty, OK? We might be operating on land. We might be operating in the sea. We might be operating in the air. We might be in the mountain. You can never know where Marines are going to operate, and it changes all the time. Your Marine could be deployed on a, a naval vessel that has no outside internet connectivity, meaning we can't go back to a data center to push data to for an entire deployment. We have no way of talking outbound. Or we might have that connection constant all the time in garrison, which is your stateside Marine who is just operating as a, as a normal you know, uh, workday. So with this uncertainty, we have to carry this mindset as a Marine into how we develop and architect and go through discovery and framing of our applications, okay? So empowered by capable software means we have to make software that is just as capable as these Marines are. It has to be able to operate in any environment that these Marines operate in, which is where I'm going to kind of unravel our first problem that we solved at the Marine Corps Software Factory with you. Um, unfortunately, I can't explain the exact solution that we did, because we have to be able to control information at some level. Um, but I am a father. I have a three-year-old at home. And no one has a better imagination than a three-year-old. So let's all just pretend like we're three-year-olds and use our imagination. And I can kind of help paint that picture for you. Um, so some preliminary requirements that we had um, going into this, right? Because rem remember, we have that marine mindset as we develop software. So we have to kind of carry that in everything that we do. So it helps us ask the customer questions through discovery and framing as to what this application needs. Uh, tactical portability based on mission requirements. So what does this mean? So again, our Marines might be operating at some compound where they'll, they'll know they'll be there for months. Or they might be moving every week. So the, our footprint turns from a light footprint to a heavy footprint, or from a heavy footprint to a light footprint. So our applications can't be reliant on infrastructure that Marines can't physically carry around with them. So this specific problem set, we had to identify a solution that could operate at whatever the Marine had at the moment, which might just be a laptop, or it might just be something called a mag tab, which is just a tablet, um, or a cell phone, right? So the, it has to be operable on diverse platforms, right? So it has to be agnostic to the device platform that it's running on. So we're thinking, OK, how can we develop an application that isn't tightly coupled to a platform? So that's just something that's in the back of our head. DDL capable, disrupted, disconnected, intermittent, low bandwidth. What does that mean? Uh, that means that we don't know that there's going to be connectivity. right? There might be connectivity. It might be low bandwidth. There might not be any connectivity. It might just be something that has to operate offline. How can we collect that data and store it offline and then persist it later on? So all of these things are built into our requirements. Okay, Rapid development timeline. Like Lieutenant Colonel Bach mentioned before, the director, he said that we have to be able to deliver software at the speed of operations. Okay, It has to be deliverable at that speed, because 
the operation might be over by the time we're ready to deploy the software. And then who did, whose problem did we solve? No one's. Maybe the future Marine that's operating, but we need to be able to deliver it at high speeds. And how can we deliver it at high speeds? Spring, right? It starts with spring. There's many other factors, but everything is a key player, okay? So our foundation, our foundation of our framework of our application was spring for many reasons. Team familiarity. We chose spring because Remember our, our Deus project, the past project that we did years ago. We, we're familiar with the framework. We're familiar with how functional it is, how out of the box it is, right? How we were able to just focus on the core functionality and kickstart our development, right? We, we didn't have to figure out, oh, how are we going to get this application deployed to users? How are we going to get this application, uh, you know, how are we going to get web services spun up? Uh, do we have to test all of this? All of this is out of the box from Spring. So what it allowed us to do is really take that user's problem and really hyper-focus on it and be able to deliver a solution at, at hyper-speed. Uh, minimal configuration changes. Uh, I literally think that we, our YAML file for configurations was uh, you could fit on this, the size of a screen, data source configurations. It, barely any configuration changes were needed um, out of the box, which is insane because it really, again, allowed us to focus on what mattered. And in scale with ease, as this application grows, we don't have to worry about scalability because we know that Spring framework is great with scaling. So our outcome, and don't worry, we'll get into the solution here too, but the outcome, we were able to go from kickoff to production in less than 45 days, 20 releases to production in less than 10 months. We delivered to 10 Marine Corps units in less than 10 months, and we had no failure rate. So what's important here is just to note that this was our first project ever at the Marine Corps Software Factory. And we, we were able to achieve these goals because of key players like the Spring Framework and like our team that enabled us. So the predecessor, I have a picture here of a friendly drill instructor screaming at a Python script. And really what's going on here is think of that drill instructor as our end user. Okay, this is the problem that we were replacing. Okay, now I'm gonna really dig you into the mind of the Marines at the tactical edge and what they had to deal with and the problem that we tried to solve for them. Right, so a script-based solution. There's nothing wrong with a Python script. I'm not a Python hater, I love Python. But when our Marines have to figure out what Python is, how to configure Python, that's a problem, right? Our, our end users shouldn't have to learn an entire language or learn the basics of a language just to accomplish the mission. So this Python script uh, is an unmaintained piece of software that someone developed one day and gave to the Marine unit as a solution. Um, dependent on third-party libraries. Uh, the libraries it was dependent on, unverified, unmaintained. We don't even know if they were secure, but they had, they had those dependencies. Uh, this part was impressive, honestly. They had an improvised integration to an external service. And what I mean by that is, quite literally, it was listening over the network for network packets to parse payloads to be able to ingest data as if it were creating like a makeshift API connection. So um, with that, it was dropping packets left and right. So some of the data that the users were expecting to get, they weren't getting at all. It was conditionally listening for specific sizes of data. So if the payload didn't meet a specific size, it would just drop it. So users are just like complaining. They're like, what is going on with this Python script? I don't know what I'm doing. I got to go learn Python. I got to go figure this out. So all of a sudden, we have Marines left and right, because what, what do Marines do? They figure it out. So Marines are trying to figure out how to code Python, how to fix this, this problem. Um, and the commanders are confused, because they're not getting the data they're expecting. Uh, they were told this Python script is the solution. What's going on? Um, and no user interface. I mean, for these poor users that have to even look at this data, like the commanders I just mentioned, they, there's no user interface to even see what's going on other than a CLI if you enable logging. Um, of course, the other systems that ingest the data this Python script is, uh, that has out of its egress, is it, they'll display data, but the script itself had no user interface. And minimal access to data. Uh, lo and behold, the external service it was connected to had a ton of data for you to access. But the users didn't know that because they didn't know anything about the external system. 
Why would, it, why would we expect a user to know how the API connection works from an external system? That's not something that we should expect. So the current solution, based on the lessons learned that we had from all of our past experiences, and based on all the feedback from the user and going through the discovery and framing process with them, um, we decided to move forward with the Spring Boot application. Device agnostic, right? As best as you can get it. Um, I, I would say our Marines are operating off of laptops for the most part at the tactical edge, um, as well as some tablets. And those tablets are connected to a deployed network, meaning a small little infrastructure that they have locally that doesn't connect externally. So what, what does that give us the ability to do? Well, we know Spring serves your, your website, right? It has embedded Tomcat so we can serve our site on this small little network that we have. So that means the Marines with tablets can pull up that solution that you've built. Marines on laptops can pull up that solution. Marines at the COC, which is like our, uh, our combat operating center, they can pull up that solution. So anyone has access to that solution, all because of how we were able to embed the Spring framework at the core. So now our users have a user interface. We built one with React, TypeScript, uh, bundled it into our Spring application when it was built. Um, and we were able to deploy it to our end users. Uh, it's got an external API connection through a Java library. Who would have thought that the external system actually has a Java library for you to use to connect as an API? All it took was a little bit of research and um, through the DNF process, and, and we identified that, hey, there is an external connection that we can actually fulfill with an API connection through a Java library. And uh, there was a lot of data that we had access to, too. And the commanders were able to visualize all that data and see it on our React TypeScript front end that we built. All of our users could do all the user configurations that they would have to do through the Python script easily on our front end as well. All this bundled into that Spring application, packaged into an executable for ease of use. So our users, uh, again, are operating off of laptops, so typically deployed to a cloud environment. And again, this can be deployed to a cloud environment easily through configuration changes. But our end users are operating at the tactical edge, so we have to make the application portable and accessible for them. So how do we do that? We bundle it as an EXE. They can launch it without any configurations and have their Spring app hosted. So that's our solution. That was the awesome experience that we had. Now, I want to wrap this up, and I was going to wrap it up by saying how awesome Spring is and how it's a great framework and we should all use it, but I'm not going to do that because we already know how awesome Spring is. I feel like everyone in this room understands Spring is awesome. Um, instead, I want to take you back to the word empowerment that I had mentioned before. Okay, Spring was one key in our tool chain for empowerment. But another piece of that empowerment is the organization and the culture in the organization. And if, that, if the culture in the organization allows for innovation, then we, the developers, will be able to innovate solutions like this because the culture itself allowed for it, right? It's, it's, it's really just about the leadership in the organization allowing us and empowering us to move forward and develop solutions like this. The Spring framework might not be the one-size-fits-all framework, but what is a one-size-fits-all is the empowered team that can develop software for any solution. I guarantee you, your team can solve any problem out there if they're empowered. That's all I have for today. Stay connected. You can email me. You can follow me on LinkedIn. Any questions? Yeah, absolutely. Sorry about that. Yes. The Marine Corps Software Factory? Yeah. So the Marine Corps Software Factory officially stood up in March. So this was our very first project that we used the Spring Framework. And I would say that this project was technically uh, instantiated before March, but officially the organization stood up in March. So I would say uh, as a Marine developing software, 2021 was our first experience. Um, but in the Software Factory, um, technically this was our first. 
Yes. I'm sorry, my hearing is horrible. How does my data? Oh, okay. Yeah, so it depends. It's very, right now, it's honestly uh, very volatile. It could be one thing one day, another thing the next day. Right now, we have quite a lot of projects. So um, we have one that's going through a DNF process that we're identifying and fully scoping through with our stakeholders and users. Um, we have one that I just mentioned that's in production, and we're always getting user feedback, looking through new features in our backlog. Um, we have another one uh, that uh, another team member, and keep in mind, right now there's only two software engineers at the Marine Corps Software Factory. We have two going through schooling, so we have to manage all these projects internally. Um, there's, there's a lot of software development happening there, I can tell you that. And a lot of awesome, awesome uh, people in that organization empowering us to do and focus solely on that software development. Did I answer your question? Awesome. Anything else? Uh, yes. What kind of capabilities are you empowering the warfighter with on the infantry side of the house from the software development standpoint? Come find me afterwards, and I can explain that off to the side. Yes. Right now, we're actually partnered with the Army Software Factory to share infrastructure um, and production platform services as well. So uh, that's currently right now where we're looking to host our applications for the time being. So that's the Army Software Factory, and that's out of Austin, Texas, which is where we're located. Yes. Could you repeat the last? I would say we're, we are learning lessons from everyone, right? Because we, we don't want to repeat patterns that um, we don't need to. And we want to build a solution um, or a platform that really encompasses the, the good from everywhere else and then make it even better. Yes. OK. So how we host our services, right? So. Right now, we're sharing infrastructure and we're sharing platform services with the Army because we identify how awesome and streamlined their process is, right? They have a decoupled security pipeline that runs with your production level code, right? So we have, for example, I'll walk you through the, the workflow of uh, pushing some changes up to production, okay? Um, and I'll keep it at a level that hopefully can be interpreted by anyone. So, we make changes, right? We push that code up. It goes through our CI, our integration pipeline. That's where our unit tests are gonna be run, right? So that's gonna be your front end, your back end, your integration tests if you have them, right? In a different decoupled pipeline, we have security scans that are being done as well, right? So this is your static code analysis, your dependency scans, anything that you need to make sure that your application is secure based on your organization's goals, right? And you could put threshold limits for like, oh hey, you. You need 80% level um, for your test coverage and whatever you want to put in there. All right, but what it allows at that decoupled level is for you to independently run your security scans from your unit tests. So that way, one isn't reliant on the other. So by the time you're pushing to production, it's no surprise that you have vulnerabilities. You're already identifying that at the developer level when you're pushing code up to your main branch. So things like that we learned, right? We learned what is a good workflow so we could get to production as fast as possible. Does that answer your question? We can go more in depth too if you want to talk afterwards. Feel free to come find me. Yes. Yes, yeah, I think so. So uh, we'll talk about how applications are deployed. So typically, I would say uh, when partnering with the, the Army Software Factory, and really most organizations out there, we talk about deploying cloud apps, right? Apps to the cloud. Um, and we're quickly realizing that that's not always the use case, right? It's always the goal to have services that you can provide at any commercial network 
and people can access that, that service. But um, we've noticed that Marines often operate in different environments, uncertain environments. So how do we efficiently and effectively deploy software to those Marines that can't use cloud services, that need to run things natively off the computer or the platform itself that, that they're operating off of? So uh, something that I would like to define an even better solution for. We have a great solution for delivering production level applications that are like that, that aren't you know, hosted in the cloud, like on like a Tanzu application service or Tanzu application platform. Um, but we, it would be nice to figure out a repeatable way that's even better. So I think that's where we're moving towards is how do we deliver software that isn't in the cloud? How do we have that delivered directly to the tactical edge so that way these Marines can have the software when they need it, and they don't need to, to reach out to us to, to obtain it. Does that answer your question? Cool. There's plenty of other lessons learned that, um, that we'd like to share, too, with other organizations as we, as we find them as well. Any other questions? What did I get my wife for her birthday? I actually flew in all of her. So today's my wife's birthday, for those of you that don't know. Um, unfortunately, yeah. I didn't get a plan when I spoke. I just got a plan that I speak. So, um, but I flew in all of her friends last night to our house. So we live in Texas. So I flew them all in. They surprised her last night. I think I said, like, my coworker has a uniform item that he needs to pick up. Can you have it ready for him? And she, like, woke up at 11 p.m. and, like, opened the door, and all her friends were there. So. Yeah, that's what I did. Yes. Yes. Yep, we're all physically in Austin, Texas. And that was um, actually very recently that we all, um, what we call PCS, which is just permanently changing our duty station down to Austin, Texas. So um, that was within the past two months. Also, if you have questions that you don't want to publicly state, feel free to find me afterwards. More than happy to go over anything with anyone else. Last call for questions. All right. Thank you.